Well, today we're going to talk about our trip to the Philippines, and um, and I'm gonna. I would like you to welcome John and Mimi Robertson as they come up and join me. Isn't this exciting? Robertson Hussey hyphen. Okay, so you know what? We're going to just pass this around. Okay, so I would really like just to them. I would like them to kind of kick it off and start. Uh, about it. Uh, this thing, I, uh, I can introduce them. First of all, are we ready to do the nursery? Okay. So, all right. It sounds like he's ready. I, I asked, he said, yeah. I, all right. He said it like a pirate. Okay. Um, yes, he does. Yes. Okay. Yes, it sounds like we had the mother load. That's been discovered. Okay, now, um, we got to go to the, uh, to the Philippines uh, in the beginning of May. Um, it was kind of conceived. I've been praying about going back. Uh, we took off the 2018. I didn't go. I went twice with Abner and uh, fell in love with a particular uh, set of churches there in the southernmost island of Mindanao, and um, which is uh, an island that, at the bottom part of it has all the troubles with the terrorists and stuff. Um, but at the same time, there's just a really, there's a really hungry group of, of young people that love to worship God. And I said, I told Abner, I said, I'm coming back for them. So I went back in 2017 with Marianne, and we just had the best time with them. And then I skipped 2018. And so when we prayed about 2019, the Lord just put together a wonderful team. And I have to say that these guys here really, I was, I mean, they were the best. They were the best. And then they brought another couple with them that were just terrific. They couldn't be here today, but I couldn't have had a better team. And you all know, pa, you know, David uh, Bates and Michelle didn't come on this one. And we prayed about it, too. And we knew Marianne, you know, she had to do babysitting time, so she didn't come either. So I had David to hang out with, but I also had these guys to hang out with and to minister with. And all I can say is, at this point, is that I kind of was expecting this, and God did this. God just went so far beyond. I was so blessed by this trip, and I know they were. And so I'm going to hand this mic over and just have them kind of tell their perspective because this was their first time in the Philippines and their first time uh, with me on a trip, okay? Uh, and I just want them to share what it was like for them because I know that as a church, we have just been supporting missions for years and years and years and years, and it never gets old, never gets old. So with that... I turn the mic over to Miss Mimi. Good morning. Good morning. How's everybody doing? For those of you that don't know me, I am Mary Carol's daughter, um, the youngest. Yeah, my <laughs> her favorite daughter. Um, I, I I need to be honest. I had a very different vision of what this morning was going to be like, and it didn't involve putting together the video at the last minute, which is what I was just doing during worship. Um, because yesterday, my husband and I went skydiving, <laughs> which was pretty crazy. I remember one time he asked me, babe, what can I do for you? Uh, you guys remember that song, um, the old meatlo meatloaf song, I Would Do Anything for Love? Yeah, so I was like, well, how about skydiving? And he said, but I won't do that. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, he did do it. So anyways, we're, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, Jesus was there. Jesus was there, yeah. Yeah, we were like, I ah. can't acknowledge that in the video <laughs> while flying. I'm like, thank God, because apparently he's not done yet. Uh, I said, thank you. Thank you to the Lord, because apparently he's not through with me, because I don't think I could have made it through if not. So, yeah, Anyways, now I know how much he loves me, guys. Um, but um, I guess before we get into the rest of it, I just want to, I just can we just honor Pastor John? You guys, I think that it's, 
I think that it's so easy to get accustomed to your leader that you you almost take them for granted without meaning to, and you're like, yeah, I know that he's great. Well, he really is. And there was such a beauty to this anointing that he has that he kind of just spread all over us when we went to minister to him, and there was just um, boldness in the way that we ministered and the way that we were just able to go for what we felt like the Lord was. And, and it was totally the grace on your life and on your ministry, and you just extended that to us, and we were able to move in that with him because of what you carry and I just I just want to honor that before we go any further it was just a really special time so John had originally asked me about going and the Philippines before this had never really been on my radar but I thought hey I'll go anywhere because I want to travel and clearly I'm up for anything as evidenced by yesterday but um I I was really excited about it, but I, I've been doing a lot of things recently that have not involved my husband, and so I'm like, I don't want to have to have an experience that I have to come home and explain to him. I want us to be able to share in that. And so we had started praying about it, and the Lord really just orchestrated everything so beautifully, and even in just hearing, I'll let you tell your side of that. But And then I randomly mentioned it to my friend um, Shua. His full name is Joshua, but we call him Shua and his wife, and he was like, you know, I've been thinking about going to the Philippines. And so, I mean, literally, it just all fell together within a week from then. I mean, he's one of those, like, faith people, you know. I wish I could be like that. I'm not like that at all. He's like, oh, I'm going. I mean, after I just told him a week before, he's like, I'll, I'll be going with you on that trip. And I'm no like, job. Okay. <laughs> okay, man. So, um, and we just, you know, we just sent out letters and asked our church and the Lord really came through in people's hearts to give and I also just want to thank all of you guys for what you gave because um, I really think more than anything it seeds that we planted in into who they are and to who they're going to be and you were a part of that you're partnering in um, sowing into their destiny and they're a very, um, the Philippine culture is very unassuming. They're very small in stature. And I think that has made them very easily overlooked by the world at large. And there's something really special when the Lord has his eye on people. And he says, I'm going to send you to them. And I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to make you a mirror so that they can see who they are in you. And you get to reflect the way that I see them back to them. So I felt like a lot of this trip dealt so much with identity, and it was very much an investment. And I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I know that we're, we're gearing up to go back because these people just stole our hearts in the best way, and they're just... just wonderful people. I'm going to get really choked up talking about it because there's something really special when you just get to meet your other, your other siblings in the Lord. And God gives you such a heart for them. Um, anyways, I'll let you talk. Yeah, I think in America we're very, uh, you might meet another Christian and you just see them at the grocery store and you're like, oh yeah, you go to that church. But there's not this emotional response like oh you know we praise the same god on sunday morning um and after going uh to the philippines it's funny because they're on the opposite side of the planet so they're 12 hours ahead of us so they've had this morning service 12 hours ago um so yeah it's almost yeah yeah it is it's almost midnight um so anyway but it's funny now when we try to talk thank Thank goodness for the internet. Now we can FaceTime and actually share things and uh, get connected. But um, you got to time it right. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I absolutely, beginning of this year, I mean, we didn't, when did we actually start talking about doing this? It was January. That's crazy to think that you're going to raise enough money, plan properly, uh, get there safely, <laughs> and actually prepare properly as well. Um, what you're going to say, what you're going to do. and But we did, because of uh, 
the other part of the group's willingness to be available both for planning um, and orchestrating how the days were going to look, which is funny because as we're on the flight over there, John's a little spontaneous, and he's like, you know, I don't think we're going to go right into a session after lunch. I think we need worship there. And we're like, you're probably right. We did already plan this out in print, like what was going to happen. <laughs> so the program's done. But so, but I tell you what, because of that availability, and the same thing is true for in general, as we were teaching, as we're having sessions of just teaching and, and you know, passing on information each time instead of how we had it laid out which means next time we're going to plan differently but um, the way we had it scheduled out was like we'd ha we'd ha in have installments of activation or involvement directly with the people and on the very beginning in the very beginning of the first day we were like we started doing that and we're like this is what this whole thing needs to be. So instead, it was like almost every session was like, and now let's get up on our feet, and now let's go talk to a stranger, and let's connect, let's pray, let's let's worship together intimately. And so it just changed the whole dynamic of the whole trip. And what was funny about that, so each day was like that, bam, 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 and you'll get to see some of that in the video. On the like fifth, sixth day that we were there, whatever it was, we had a partial, you know, we had a day off right before church, uh, oh well, Sunday, where we ended up ministering to three different churches. Some of us split up at different services. Um, but it was like we were like, bam, from church to church to church. It was really fun uh, throughout Sunday before heading back here. But on Saturday, we were hanging out with the worship team, and we're having this talks. We're spending time at the hotel together. But we were sitting down and having this talk with one of the girls on the worship team. And we said, you know, we saw uh, pictures or something that they had gone to a conference a few weeks prior to ours, like a month before or something. And she said, yeah, yeah. I don't, she said, I, I really think that this one was really uh, very different um, for our church, for our people, um, for everybody that went. And I said, well, why do you say that? And she said, well, that one. She's like, I don't know how to say it. We were sitting, and I was like, okay. Like, they basically just sat the whole time. It was a talking head up here, just talking, trying to impart knowledge. But that's not what the church life is supposed to be. We're supposed to be doers, not hearers only. And so it was really neat to think, well, naturally, because we were all responsive, because John is a spontaneous person because Mimi is a spontaneous person because Shua, our, our other brother who came with us, is a spontaneous person, David Bates. And and then Robin and I are both like the, oh, no, we're going to do it this way. It's so funny because then we're like, well, we can bend with that. And I'm telling you, by day two when John's like, you know, I don't think I'm going to do the afternoon session. Do you want to take and And you're like, yeah. I'll, I'll do it. I think I got something. And I tell you, it's different. It's totally different. But God used our flexibility with that to do what he wanted to do and really impact these kids. And it's not like it's not about numbers, but we did have like almost double than what they told us the expected impact was of people that we were going to reach was going to be. And we were like, really? Almost 200? OK, cool. Like, it's not what we expected. And it's not huge. But I tell you, these people gain strength from that, that they're going to continue and impact, you know, their group, their influence. And hopefully we'll keep doing that and building it, and not building because of numbers, but building because of people and souls, because these people need that hope. They carry joy like nobody I've ever seen, but they carry a lot of pain. And that's why Mimi was saying we were talking to identity because we could tell. But they're coming in with expectancy, which is always important when you're coming into church. But they're also carrying outside of church. They're carrying hope and sharing it with other people. And I just encourage you guys to try to do that, too. Thank you so much for supporting Pastor John. Yeah, absolutely. And here's your pastor. Okay. No. Uh, I want to talk about David Bates because uh, David, see, what happened was David just told me last year, he just said, John, are you going on any trips next year? I was like, well, probably. He goes, well, I just want to go with you. Now, I've seen David teach here, okay? But I had no clue 
what David was going to do. I did, you know what I'm saying? I, it's not like I'd been to a lot of his sessions. I went to one other session he did in Roanoke just to see. I wanted to see what, what, am, I, what am I into. Because <laughs> he was already with me one time, but, but he did something in Roanoke too. So I had no idea how well suited he was for these guys and where we were going because he did nonstop activations, prophetic activations. I don't know, are you gonna talk about some of that? Okay, so she's gonna talk more about it. But you see, I, well, I just, I, just didn't, I just didn't expect David to do so well. You know what I'm saying? It was just such a, uh, a terrific uh, a flow together and a, a chemistry on the team that was just really outstanding. That was just, and what he did was he did some prophetic activations that, in, that would work very well with large numbers of people. So what he did was is he divided people up into groups of 10 apiece, and they literally did like where there was one person in the front, and then not the rest of the team, nine of them, would walk up to the first person and just give them one word. Uh, just ask the Holy Spirit to give you one word for that person. And then they did a rapid fire, and it was hilarious to watch. Because people are standing there, and then one person would come up and say one word, and another, then they would go to the back of the line, and the next person would come up and say another word. And all this was going on with about 170 people all at the same time, just talking and carrying on. And you could visibly see the people getting ministered to just breaking under the, the presence of God, things that were being said to them with one word. It was fantastic. Yeah, it was called a word of knowledge, yeah. And it was like rapid fire. So uh, that was just a great example how well David went uh, and how good of a team member he is. That's one thing about going on a mission trip that I'm, those of you that have been on trips know when you got a good one, it's like, yes. Because if you haven't gotten a good one, if you've got one that's hard to work with, it's really bad. It can be really bad. So, huh? About a team member, yeah. Yeah, because uh, I'll never forget a trip I took to Nyson one time. Anyway, uh, <coughs> and it was not a fun trip because a team member was just not a good team member. So I, I just thank God for that. Anyway, back to me. Yeah, we, we did spend a lot of time, like, laughing and joking. Everybody was, was in a pretty good mood, even though we all were suffering from jet lag. I mean, most of us were waking up at, like, 12 two, three, four in the morning, but there was just so much grace. Um, I'm trying to think of where I wanted to take that, but, oh yeah, one of the things that I just have to tell you that uh, David, he just had such a great sense of humor, and he's a great father, and before I get into his joke, I just want to say the church has enough brothers and sisters. It needs more mothers and fathers. Okay? Hear that. If you feel everyone is called to mentoring, everybody is called to pouring out your life to people who are younger with less experience than you, we all need to be engaging in that because the church is suffering, the church here, the church globally. So I just want to encourage you this morning, I've just really felt that burning in my heart. The church needs more mothers and fathers. Amen. And you can be a mother or father if you are 19 years old. You know, if you're 16 years old, you know, it, it's it's a part of what the Lord gives grace to. So anyway, so D David was tr like we had not really we thought that the language that they spoke was Tagalog, but actually that was the language of Manila and each island has their own language. And so the one that we should have been learning was Bisaya. And so anyways, there was this phrase for um, good afternoon and it was Maya Hapon. And so David <laughs> just started saying that for everything. He would just be like, oh, this, this lunch is very good, Maya Hapon. <laughs> and it was so funny. It just became like the running joke. So if you ever hear us say something like that, it's, that's what we mean. Um, it's really funny. Oh, they did think it was funny. It was, it was a good time. Yeah, Maya Hapon. Maya Hapon. 
Um, I also want to say that I thought that David's teaching were just fantastic. I thought to myself, if I had had this teaching when I was, you know, a young girl, I feel like my prophetic journey would be in a much different place now. Um, but it was just really beautiful the way that he empowered people um, in just really knowing that they hear from the Lord. And it was also really cool to see people discover that. They're like, oh, like the Lord can speak to me too. It's not just through people on the stage. Like he can talk through anybody. And the prophetic gift, we, we've just mystified it in this way that it almost seems untouchable and that there are only like certain people who possess this. And that's not true. And I'm not going to say that everybody moves in the same anointing with it. I'm, don't hear me say that. But what I'm saying is it is, it can be available to those who seek it. And so if your heart is, is hungry for that, he, he will honor it. Get around people who are also pursuing that to encourage you. Um, one of the things that made a particular impact for me was um, the tenderness of heart that these these kids had. Um, the first day that I got up to speak, and I was really nervous, and I, I feel like I was coming up against my own feelings of insecurity and inadequacy the day before, and I was, I don't even really know why, I was just kind of terrified to get up and speak, because it's just such a weighty thing to do, especially with people who, one, you haven't earned their trust yet, and two, like, this is the only context they have for you, and you're like, I want to be able to speak clearly and lovingly and, and well, so that the Lord is represented well, and there, there's a lot of weight to that, but I just felt like the Lord said, just be vulnerable. Just be vulnerable with him. Just be you. Just be yourself, and that will be enough. So I got up in front of them, and I told them, I'm nervous, guys. I just need to be honest. So would you just, would you just, you know, stretch out your hand to me and pray for me? And it was like, you know, the whole room is like, oh, okay, you know, she's human. Like, awesome. And it's, it's amazing what a little vulnerability does because it, it earns the trust of the room. It earns the trust of people. And they're like, oh, she's just like me, which is, which is what we want people to feel. We're all alike. Just because somebody gets up on a stage doesn't mean that they're any better or more spiritual than anyone else, anyone. And we've got to demystify this platform because it creates boundaries between, or not ba not boundaries, barriers between you and other people. So I shared with them a bit of my story and I, and I talked to them about receiving the heart of the Father. And it's really amazing when you've really, I don't know, just gotten to that place of surrender where the Lord is directing you and, and you're kind of out on a limb and you're like, this could go really badly or it could go really great. And that's kind of where I was. And the Lord's been speaking to me about, um, well, I want to, can I share a little bit about what I spoke? I don't want to get into that too much, but um, I've just had this revelation. There was a scripture that I was reading about being face to face with the Lord, and there is a different interpretation of that where it, um, it means mouth to mouth. And there's something about being really close when someone's talking to you. A few years back, I was in a play. And I was having a really hard time uh, getting emotionally connected to what was happening in the show because I was, um, something had happened like a few minutes before in the play and I was just having a hard time connecting to what was happening. And like in the play, like my cousin is, is dying in my arms and I just couldn't, I just couldn't connect emotionally to it. And I had a director who told me, well, why don't, when you're listening to him, open your mouth. And I was like, well, that seems kind of odd. And she said, no, she said, you've got to breathe him in because he's sharing the same breath with you. And if you breathe in what he's saying to you, it's going to unlock you emotionally. Because when we listen so often, we keep our mouths closed because I think we're trying to protect ourselves because we're afraid of what we could hear or we're afraid that somebody's going to hurt us with their words. And so we kind of walk around with this like defense. And 
it was amazing because I was listening to him and he was saying beautiful things. I mean, in the script, it was just like, I love you and I've always loved you and I'm going to miss you and you've been a good cousin to me. And I remember opening my mouth and literally just breathing in what he was saying. And it was like, I just completely unlocked. My heart unlocked in that moment and I just began to weep. And I think there's something about that too when the Lord comes in close to just let all the defenses down and to breathe them in. And so I had them do an exercise. I said, I just want you to open your mouth because this is how close he is. At any moment, this is how close he is. Just open your mouth and breathe in what he's saying to you. It was like all over the room. They just started weeping. And the Lord was just speaking to them and you could see it. I don't know what he was saying. It's none of my business but he was speaking love, he was speaking love over them to them, and they were letting down their defenses and receiving it. And so we, we had talked to um, one of their pastors about, you know, just in general, and she said, you know, they don't really have anywhere where they're alone. They're around people all the time. They live in homes where 10 or more people live. I mean, we can't, I'm sure we can't even fathom what that's like, guys. We're so isolated in America. We don't know what it's like. We all have our own rooms. We have tons of privacy. We don't know what it's like to not be able to get alone. And just to see these kids like pour their hearts out to the Lord and just let themselves weep and let the Lord tenderize their heart with his love was like literally so life-altering for me. It was so beautiful, and that we got to partner with that. It was just so moving, and she said, you don't know what this means to them, to have you speak these things to them, for you, an outsider, a foreigner, to come in and tell them it's okay to weep before the Lord. It's okay to pour your heart out to him when you're in pain, because your worship and your offering and your sacrifice doesn't have to look like anybody else's. He just wants you to look like you. And he's honored by that. Anyways, I could go on all day about that, but there were so many different occasions where we got to minister to them like that, where we got to just observe God ministering to them. And it was a huge honor. And I just, I mean, I've, I've just been changed. I've just been changed by it. And I, I feel like before I went, like I was asleep. I don't even know why. I just was asleep. And it was like the Lord woke me up. And ever since I've come back, I'm like, God, please don't let me fall back asleep in my comfort. Don't let me fall back asleep in, in, in the ease of life here in America. Because that's, you've not called me to be comfortable You've not called me for that. You have more for me than that. So just, I mean, obviously that's what he's speaking to me, and I don't want to, like, you know, tell everybody, all right, everybody, it's everybody's job to not be uncomfortable because, you know, I want to honor where you're at, but I just want to encourage you, if there's anything stirring your heart right now by what I'm saying, it might be the Lord, and he might be saying, come out of that sleep. I've got adventures for you. It's not over. I've got adventures for you. If you'll just trust me, if you'll just come with me. So there's not a whole lot to do <laughs> after that. I will just say that my, oh, there isn't. There's not a whole lot else I should share other than, um, just to encourage you that uh, even Mimi, who has a big heart and has a lot of people that she influences and connects with, um, and she continually tries to connect with, um, whether it's you know women who have endured trauma or just people in our church or outside of our church, um, trying to reach those who have undergone similar pain that she's gone because God uses our pain 
in order to help us to be affectionate. That's, that's how we can have empathy. And that's how we know that Jesus has empathy because, because he endured the cross. And that wasn't just for our sin. It also says it was for our shame. So when we combat shame, we're also partnering with Christ in that because he understood. I think that's why he was weeping tears of blood. It wasn't for himself. I think that the weight of depression, shame, all of that was already coming on him as he was going to his journey to the cross to pay for it, but to also put it away. So Mimi didn't think that she had any more room in her heart. <laughs> well, now she's trying to f arrange <laughs> 200 more souls that she cares passionately about who write to us on Facebook who are like, don't forget me. Don't forget me. And we're like, oh my gosh, there's so many of you. <laughs> I can't remember someone I meet in the grocery store. You don't want me to remember you. I care so much. I will try, you know? And so we're just associating pictures with faces. And, um, and even as she's going through this, make, putting this video together, you know, she's like, I don't, I can't even go through this. Just watching this video is making me cry <laughs> again. So anyway, John, if you want anything else before Mimi. The other thing I wanted to say was, if this excites you, you should go with us next time. I'm serious, because these kids just need people to love on them. Most of them don't even know who their parents are. They haven't been raised by parents. They're raised by people in their lives. You need to get them. Okay. Um, we're just real. We're just going to be ourselves. We're not fancy or polished. <laughs> but yeah, or find your people. Find the people God's called you to. You know, it doesn't have to be the Philippines. It could be anywhere. It could be, it could be in the ghettos of Martinsville. You know, find your people. Because it will change your life. That's what God wants. He wants our hearts to be alive, to be tender tender to all the people who are coming to him. And we need everybody. We need all hands on deck. I'm really intense, and I don't mean to, like, be super intense with you guys, but this is just, this is where I'm at. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I'm channeling my dad. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah. If you guys have any interest in coming with it, come, come with us or partner with us, help us. We really couldn't have done this trip without you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Oh, one other thing. I mean, w what was so awesome was the Lord provided even above what we needed for the trip. And so we were able to, well, we were able to help one of the guys who needed a, a hospital visit. He had had this really weird fluke thing yeah it was the oh man and you'll see him in the video his name is pastor rudy he had a bug a bug that went in his ear and, and it was it was just i mean like you're like what in the world there's a bug that got in this guy's ear and he had to get it removed and we were able to help him with that financially um and then one of the other things was we were able to yeah His wife also had a staph infection, a major staph infection. It was dangerous because those, once it gets in your blood, um, but yeah, it was attacking her leg. And so, yeah, we, we poured over that in prayer and also some financial support. And so she's doing okay too. So, yeah. We were able to get a keyboard. There, this, the, this, oh man, this beautiful, beautiful woman. Her name is Wendy. She's around my age. Um, she was just, <laughs> God love her. She's, she was playing her heart out on this piece of junk that, and she was doing it, man, for the Lord. And he was so honored by that. And we were able to, to buy her a new keyboard with the money that you gave, with the money that everyone gave to this trip. And she's so excited. They've been sending us videos of her playing this. And they're just like, your money is not, it's not just, it, it, it is, it is seeds that you're planting that are going to grow. So 
I just want I just want to thank you guys so much for that. Do you want to play the video now? Yeah. yeah. Try try not to cry. <laughs> okay? I'm just kidding. Let me be filled with kindness and compassion for the one. The one in whom you love and gave your son for humanity. Increase my love. Help me to love with open arms like you do. A love that erases all the lines and sees the truth. Oh, they would never. Father's love Cause oh how you love us From the homeless To the famous And in between Cause you formed us You made us carefully Cause in the end We're all your children me to love with open arms like you do. A love that erases all the lines and sees the truth. Oh, that when they look in my eyes, they would see you. Even in just a smile, they would feel the Father's love. So let all my life tell of who you are And the wonder of your never-ending love Oh, let all my life tell of who you are That you're wonderful and such a good father to leave Butuan. My own Hapon. We miss you already, Butuan. Love you guys. We'll be back. Oh, man. Well, one of the things they said, they said we were the first foreigners that they'd ever met that they really felt like a bond and a connection to. And I think some of that was because we really went over there with the intention of like creating relationships and we wanted them to, we wanted to connect in our humanity. And um, Shua had the brilliant idea that we should invite them to our hotel, which by the way, is like one of the nicest hotels in the entire city. And I mean, it was nothing for us to book there and we didn't know how much it would mean to them. We just, we just invited them over for the day to spend the day at the pool and they were so excited, they said, We've never been to this hotel. We've never been inside. Some of them have never been to a hotel at all. And they were just so, 
I guess, just honored by the fact that we would want to spend time with them, that we would want to, you know, to to give of what we had to them. And that's why God allows us to be as rich as we are, not so that we can hoard it for our own comfort, but so that we invite other people into the wealth that we have been given. And we were able to do that. And, you know, it just makes you feel so valuable when somebody, like, welcomes you into that and says, come take part in this with me. Because this isn't just for me, it's for you too. So... I'm just going to keep crying all morning if you let me have this mic. So. <laughs> I know how she feels. Uh, John, did you say anything else? John, John really, uh, you know, when we first were doing this, we were most, remember our prayer group was praying for this whole thing. And at first, uh, I thought we would get Mimi, and then uh, I was thinking of Landon's daughter, Landon Spradlin's daughter. Jesse to go. At first I thought, well, we'll just get those two to go because John wasn't in the picture at that time. We weren't really thinking. So then Jesse couldn't do it, you know, and that, that, so we kind of, that shifted. And we've been praying. We were praying about that with the Tuesday prayer meeting, and we knew that things were going to be shifting about the original plan, and they did. And, uh, and John, uh, and I knew the condition of the electrical work there in some of the places we were going. Uh, and John could probably tell you better, <laughs> more accurately. But I just knew by the time we got to that, started going on the trip, I just knew that John was going to be ministering really well. And he did. He just did so great. Uh, and he shared terrific, terrific words with, with everybody. And that to me was a blessing because, you know, you just think you, sometimes you just don't know until you take a step. And so I just wanted to thank John for being willing to just step into that and watch God do really great things uh, with it. And <laughs> there may be some electrical work done someday, and that's okay. But you know what I'm saying? But, but you know. I, yeah. I just can't speak well enough about John's session. He, he um, spoke the first and second day about you will have a song and about how God has a song specifically for all of us. And so one of the activations that he was doing, and I have some of these things on video. I'm going to be, like, sending them out. But... Anyway, um, so Sam is the sound technician for, um, I'm sure you guys saw the group that we took a lot of pictures with, Consecrate. They're like their own worship band, and they're at one of the churches. Um, and he is the sound technician for them. And, you know, sometimes sound technicians, they, you know, they don't, they don't get seen because it's not their job to be seen. You know, it's their, it's their job, it's their job, you know, to really support what's going on, on on stage. And so they're they're just these these quiet servants, you know? And I felt and so John was like, you know, just pick somebody and and pray for them and pray that you'll get a song for them. And so I just it was like immediately I just thought, Sam, Sam's the guy. So I went over and I just started singing to him and I and I just said, He he sees you. You're not hidden. You're not hidden behind this soundboard. He sees you, and he has a song for you. I just started singing that out, and he was just weeping. You know, because, I mean, who doesn't want to just be seen? Who doesn't want to be acknowledged by the Lord? And sometimes we think, you know, he's got so many kids. You know, how can I have, how can I have any of his attention? But he has enough for everybody. He's not... He's not living in scarcity. God has plenty of attention to be able to designate that just for you. And, and I was, and it's just, it's just speaking value over people. And that, I mean, it just empowers you to feel like, oh man, God can use me. And then think about all the people that he's going to be able to give value to and empower, you know, and that's how it starts. Starts one step at a time, empowering leaders, and then and he has and I'm in man. It's like, ever since we left, he it was just like, everything that I've seen him post, he's just so excited. He's just so excited about what the Lord's doing, in him, and and he's just you know you just pass on the torch. So he was particularly special to me, and um, he was the one with John. John had a, a green shirt on, and he was the guy standing with John. That was Sam.
That was an interesting moment. I don't. I I love. Uh, I'm a performer, so I don't mind singing in in public. And I don't mind speaking in public as myself, but I don't like singing as myself. Uh, it's just an awkward. I don't know why. There's a block for me. That there's a difference in that for me. But um, yeah. So then John's like looking at me, like, like John, you gonna <laughs> no. Mimi, okay, and Mimi goes, and I'm like, yeah, she stole Stam from me. I was gonna sing over Sam, <laughs> but anyway, I was like, I was like, I don't, and I and I did for a time. I wandered all the way to the back. I'm like, I don't want to sing. I don't want to <laughs> sing. If I'm in a group, I'm fine, but by myself, a cappella. And I moved back up to this guy I did not know, and um, and he's always kind of there, you know, arms crossed. And it's funny because this is true in America, our body language and our approach at church. You know, you'll have maybe not in your style church as much because we're smaller. And but you in my where what I grew up in is more, uh, you know, you, you have people that hide. Now people just hide at home. They don't go anymore. But people who hide and they don't want to connect and they disconnect either in worship, in prayer or in the service. One of the, you know, something along those lines. And what I found there specifically, um, and this happened both in the worsh- in that one when I worshipped, and then another time I think when Robin was speaking and had us activating, and we were walking amongst everybody, and we told them they could come up and receive prayer, and a whole group comes up and they're just everybody's praying over them individually, and so I kind of worked my way through the crowd, and then there were still people, some sitting in the back, and I thought, ah, the outliers. I'm gonna I'm gonna go get some of them. And as I'm walking back there, I realize, well, they're, they may be sitting in the back, but they are still fully engaged and emotionally there. Um, and this one woman was just praying quietly, and I came up behind her, and I started praying. And I'm speaking English. And the kids, most of them understand English really well, and some of the adults do, not all of them. Um, but as soon as I started touching her and praying over her, I mean, she just started she just started crying, just letting it out. And so we just found, and the same thing was true about the boy that I started singing over. I'm like, this kid's like, I'm a tough teenager. You know, I'm a tough kid. And I don't know why, but my baritone singing over him either scared him or something, but it <laughs> broke it broke something because he put his head down and then he co- covered his face because he was crying and he didn't want everybody to see. But I'm like, dude, everybody here is crying. You're good. I'm, pr- I'm crying right now. But what I found was even in the back, and I mean, there was this group of boys, this group of, there was, when when Mimi was talking about, when David, or John was talking about, when David was uh, getting them to pray, after they did the chain, at another point, they also did a group prayer with the same group that did the chain, where they were walking around. Now, this time, they were supposed to circle up and pray, and I don't remember who was, when the excavation was, because all the days run together now. But these boys, I mean, they are shoving each other. I mean, these are a bunch of just fun-loving kids, just goofing off. And I tell you what, when you told them, okay, now one of you is a leader, you, you need to orchestrate this, and then here's what we're praying for, and you're going to pray over each other, and you're going to do this, and you're going to do that. And then all of a sudden, they stop the joking and the playing. And I'm like, man, if we could teach American kids to do this. Because they were like, okay. And they all gather together like a football huddle. And just you could see him, and, he, and the one leader, this kid, all of a sudden, he took on that leadership role, and he's like, okay, you, and then you, and then you. And, man, they started praying, and they don't, they're not afraid of getting, like, in physical contact, even though they're boys. And they're all, like, huddled together, praying like that for 10, 15 minutes. I'm like, look at these kids, man. They are just, if they have enough direction, and it's something where we wish we had it here. And it, there's boundaries and, and like Mer- Mimi said, barriers that we put up. And some of it needs to be, we have to have barriers to be safe because we can't just expose our emotions when it's not safe, when the other person's not on the same playing field, in the same plane. But once you've established that with other human beings, even people who you don't know now, and it is possible because we know it's possible on the other side of the planet, it has to be possible here to establish a trust and then an openness to be spiritually available and emotionally available 
because God can use that. And, and I really firmly believe that. And I saw it, like I said, individually with these two specific moments. And then also with the worship team later, we just had so many things where it's like little moments, but overall it becomes almost overwhelming. But yeah, I hope that made sense. Jubilee, this is the year of Jubilee. Lame now walk, blind now see, this is the year of Jubilee.